think it's about time to get started, so can you guys quiet down? I know you're excited to learn all about the bit and hear all the puns that Robert and I are going to be throwing at you over the next hour or so, except for those of you who are leaving. Speaking of which, how many of you are going to be leaving in about 20 minutes to get to a lab? That is not too terrible. Cool. Okay. Welcome to Get Well Soon. My name is Austin Anderson, and I am the president of Clemson ACM. Over here is Robert, he's the vice president. Both of us are going to be talking to you over the next hour, give or take, about the wonderful magic of the tool known as Git. We are on an IRC channel, if you'd like to come and troll us for a while. Now coming up over the next hour, we're gonna be introducing what Git is, and why you should care about it, <coughs> even if you know what Git is. After that, we're going to go through a bit of the use of Git, and do, Robert's going to show you a demo. And then we're going to go into a wrap-up and tell you about some reminders about things you should know, give you some links to resources that you will be very, uh, it would be beneficial if you actually go and take a look at them. But let's jump right in and take a look at what a Git is, aside from just an un unpleasant, contemptible person that you really don't like like me or Robert. Aside from that definition, there is one more thing you should know that is called Git, which is a free, open source, <coughs> fast and scalable and distributed version control system. Git is free as in you, get a, you can use it for free, for lunch, and it is free as in open source. Git was developed originally as a version control system for the Linux kernel, and it is by Linus Torvalds, the guy who does Linux, basically and is still in use to this day as part of the development of Linux. But what is a version control system, you ask? And why do you care? Well, think about this. Let's say that we go back in time and take a look at my projects four years ago. If I wanted to back up my code or save what I've been working on just in case I horribly mess up and do something terribly wrong. I'll probably just archive everything, shove it into some repository, uh, some other folder somewhere, and I'll probably accidentally delete it sometime or another. What if I want to try something new? For example, if I have a code project and there's a function I need to write, I'm sure many of you have run into this or will at some point, and I can do it in about four different ways and I'm not sure which one I like the best, then if I get started and start changing other things in the file and then realize that what I was doing was an absolutely terrible idea that only a stupid person would do, then I'm kind of stuck and it's gonna take at least double the time it took to write that code to go back and start over. It sucks. What about you find a bug in your code at some random point and you don't know where it is. It just doesn't work. These are things that a version control system can address. What if you're working in a group? You are eventually going to be assigned one of these group projects, probably with people that you don't know and maybe don't like. You're gonna have to email projects back and forth, share different code files. Maybe if you're really into it, you can try dipping and patching stuff. If somebody messes up, how do you make sure everyone gets the code that's fixed? Or what if somebody new joins your group and you need to get them all the code, what are they gonna do? You're gonna have to spend a day to tell them how they can download everything from three different people and run it themselves. It's gonna be terrible. These are things, again, that a version control system can help you do. The basic premise of a version control system like Git is to store your development files into one repository, also called a repo. From there, the software will track what changes, what is added, different branches of development, different versions. You can use a version control system to find where a bug was introduced in the history of your code. You can figure out who wrote a piece of code. So if, if you find one of these bugs, you can point at that guy that you, nobody likes and say, it was you. And then you can kick him out of your group in case it's zero. You can, Roll yourself back to old versions of the code. Like I, if it was four years ago, I was using Git, and I realized that my implementation of my print cat to terminal function didn't work. It got the wrong picture of a cat, and I could start over and get a new picture of a cat instead. 
you can take two different versions of the same, of, well, two different versions of code and then merge them together so you get the best of both worlds. And you can do other stuff too. Version control systems are really, really cool and there's a reason they're super popular in the industry today. It's pretty easy to bring in new teammates if you want to, well, kick out or bring in someone new to your group or the professor decides to give you someone new halfway through the project. Robert, please fill in this pun. Now we're getting somewhere. Thank you, Robert. <laughs> now, Robert is going to start talking to us about how to get started, yes, get, with get. Okay. So, this is where this becomes an interactive exercise. So if you all do not have a computer where you are logged into, I recommend that you open up a terminal, create a new directory, and change into that directory. We're going to get, do a couple of things and kind of build up and show you and get you started with implementing your first version control system directory and repository using Git. Yeah, it wouldn't be really helpful if all we did was tell you about how cool this stuff is and then go say, all right, go have fun, without teaching you how it actually works. We'll give you guys a minute or two to all get logged in. Now, you don't need to necessarily follow the stuff on the screen quite yet. We'll talk about that. Okay. Is anybody not logged in yet? So raise your hand if you are not ready to begin. Uh, if, if you need a computer, we can switch spots because I have a laptop. No. Cool. So, bit, thanks, the first thing that you're going to want to do is set up what are called your Git credentials. So this is basically some information that Git appends to every set of changes that you save to a repository. So the way that we're going to do that is we're going to do git config pass the dash dash global flag and then we're going to set the user dot name property. So if I was filling this out, I would say Robert Underwood, like so. Notice the quotes around my name. The reason why there are quotes here is because we want Bash to not separate my first name from my last name when we go to save my name into the name information. After you've set your name information, the next thing you'll want to do is set your email. So get config dash dash global user dot email and then you can give it your Clemson email like so okay 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 so what we have just done, you should not have to do ever again for any other computers until you log on to a new computer and do this for the first time. For the computer that you're currently on, and actually since the lab machines share home directories across all of the lab machines, you can actually only have to ever run this once for all of the projects that you do on the lab machines. So now that we've done this, there's a couple ways that you can get started with Git. So, Let's say, for example, that you wanted to start working on the Clemson Hack Pack, something that's an existing project. So what you could do is you could say git clone um, slash Clemson CM slash Hack Pack. Helps if you put the HTTPS at the beginning. So what it's saying right now is it's cloning into HackPack. So, that's what, so what it's doing is it's creating a directory called HackPack, which you can see right here. And HackPack now contains the entire contents of the Clemson ACM HackPack. If you're interested in working on an interesting algorithms project, this is a good project to get started with. And a place where you can help potentially use some of this knowledge that you're going to learn today, learning Git. It's this easy to get a new teammate up and running with the code that you have tracking in a group project. Yeah, like that's literally all you have to do. But let's say that you want to start on a new project. So what we can do is I've made this other new directory called test. So we're going to change into the directory called test. And then we're going to run a command called git init. 
So what that will tell you is that you've initialized a new empty git repository in the directory that you're currently located in. At this point, you are ready to start tracking changes to your repository. So any questions so far? Basically, at this point, you should just have some folder and you type the git in it from within it. Okay. Some other things that you might want to set up with your git config, we'll have the slides available after the fact if you want to look at them later. Um, you can set, like for example, your text editor that you prefer for editing stuff with in Git. Um, and you can also set your color prefer preferences for your terminal. So those are some other settings that you can set with Git config. Um, if you have credentials that are specific to a particular project, like for example, you're doing something for work and you don't want to use necessarily your global credentials that you use for all of your open source projects for that, you can also use git config without the dash dash global to set an individual project specific don't config overwhelm them yet. configuration option. So how do we track changes and update files? So. Let's look at what our current status is. Git provides a pretty easy way to do that through the git status command. Can anybody in the back not read what we have up on the screen? Make it a little bit. Oop, there we go. So git status shows that we're on the initial commit and we don't currently have any changes or anything to commit. So how do we add something? So let's have we'll a explain the rest of these scary words in a bit later. So let's add a simple text file. So when we open up our text file, we can start adding some content. Hi, we're creating a new file here with some redirection. OK. So now if we look at the contents of that file, we see that it has two lines. So let's say that that's what we want to start with on our project. So what we can do at that point is do our git status again. And we'll see now that we have what's called an untracked file. This is a file for which the version control system doesn't really know anything about at this point. Um, all of the files that you start out within your project will start out being untracked. So then your question becomes, how do I get a file from being untracked to being a tracked file? Well, you just add it to the repository. The command for doing this is pretty self-explanatory, git add file name. So what we've done right now is we've now staged the changes into the repository, but we haven't actually done the final add of the file to the repository. We've just gotten it ready to be added to the repository. So if we look at our git status again, you'll see that we have a new file with changes to be committed. So how do we then make these changes that are ready to, be, ready to be committed to the repository to actually go into the repository. To do that, we make a commit. Think of a commit as a way of saving off a current set of changes that have been staged to commit. Um, so basically, it's a collection of changes with a little bit of extra information. Imagine if you're, keeping, if you're logging the course of the development of a project. Normally, you'd say, I added this thing today, and I added this new thing, and then I fixed this bug. A log of commits, or a commit in Git, is basically an actual recording of that thing happening. So when you have fixed a bug in Git and then committed that change, Git will remember it for you, and then you can roll back or make changes involving that chunk of different code. So if you're following along on the screen, you'll notice that I have a dash M flag here. So by default, you can provide what's called a commit message. The dash M flag says, I'm going to provide the commit message at the command line without entering into the editor. I'll show you how to do this with an editor in a moment, but just to begin, we'll start simple. So now that we're told that we've created a root commit, it gives us some garbage that looks like a hash. It tells us the message that we committed with, the first line of the message that we provided, and it tells us what changes were made. So in this case, we had one file changed, two lines of text were inserted into a file called test.markdown. So at this point, it's important to talk about what exactly should go into a commit message. So Austin, do you want to talk about this? Sure. 
Now, as I was mentioning before, when you're writing, imagine you're writing a log of changes you've made to a project. The last thing you want to see if you're going back to that project to look at the stuff you did, if you want to review what you did for interview or uh, thinking about how terrible your class was, then you do not want to see that in the distant past you wrote did stuff or changed things or ASDF, 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 which I've done a few times. Don't do that, it's bad. So a proper way to record what you're doing when you are committing things to your code repository is to make a note of why you made the change and what changed. That's the most important thing, what you did. Maybe how you addressed the issue or big overall changes that were made. There's no need to write huge paragraphs. A lot of commit messages are just that single line at the top. But it's very useful for yourself and for others later if it's a group project to make notes about why you did things in your commit message. There is actually a lot of controversy over what the correct way to write commit message is. But you want to make it useful. You don't want to type ASDF, ASDF, ASDF. So just to give you an idea of why you would want to write commit messages. So I was looking at the changes that one of my fellow coworkers had made. And when he made all of his commits, he had 127 commits in his repository, every single one of them with the commit message, ha, ha. Okay. So what happened with that project? Well, you never quite know, because all you have is this, this string of just unending laughter and you wallow in self pity. All you know is that it was funny, whatever it was. <laughs> but out of nothing, code appeared. Um, so writing commit messages is very important. Um, we'll forgive you if you start out just typing did stuff. It's OK. Everyone does it. But eventually, you want to work up to making it so that it's useful. A, a commit message is useful for you and for everyone else. OK. It's better just to commit the one file or two or three files separately that you make changes to. Yeah, and we're going to talk about that a little bit in a moment. So. Let's look at now what's called the log. So this is what Git tracks in terms of the changes that were made. This is that thing I was talking about. It actually does it for you. Yeah, so no efforts in keeping up manual change logs and editing the dates that something was committed. Git does it for you. So if you look at this commit log, you'll notice a couple of things. You'll see my authorship tags, the Robert U at Clemson.edu, and you'll see the date that I made it, and the time that I made it, and the commit message that I made. Um, one other flag that you often will use with git log is what's called dash dash stat. And if you do this, it'll furthermore tell you exactly what files were changed and how they were changed. There's also dash dash patch. Yeah. Which will actually give you a diff of exactly what was changed. Now, you may not want to look at dash dash patch if you're looking at, say, a thousand commits, but if you're looking at a small range of commits or a specific commit, dash dash patch and dash dash stat can be easy ways to get a really fine grained idea of what exactly went on with the project without necessarily reading every single line of code that exists. You may see all these words. I don't understand what they mean either. The most important thing about looking at a diff is that pluses were added and minuses, which are red, were taken away. Okay, so any questions on what we see up here or the log information so far? So if you don't like to read the diff as it's presented right here with the dash dash patch command, you can also just ask for a diff. So let's execute git diff. And it doesn't show any changes currently. But let's make some additional changes to that text file that we wrote earlier. How did you get out of the patch? Um, it just prints it, so yeah. you don't necessarily have to get out of it. If your computer you did it, but it's running like still on this. Okay. You may have to type Q if you piped it into less or something of that form. So what we've done is we've added even some more stuff to the end of the file. So if we do a cat of the file, 
we'll see that we have some more stuff. And let's run our get diff again. You'll now see that we have a new line that has been appended to the file. <laughs> um, and that, as Austin suggested, it shows up with a plus at the beginning of the line, showing you exactly what was changed. So this can be really sim really useful if something wasn't compiling, in, or if you had something compiling, you changed something, you're not exactly sure what you changed. This can be a good idea to use to help review exactly what you changed before you go and make a commit. So the next thing that you'd want to do is you may want to see when a line was last edited. For this, you use the blame command, because this can be really useful in figuring out exactly when to blame Austin for all of the hey. terrible code changes that he makes. So, git blame is always done with a file name. So... Oh wow, look, it was all Robert. Yeah, I know, that happens sometimes. So, what you'll see on the left-hand side, First, you'll see the commit hash, which is basically a unique identifier corresponding to the particular set of changes that we saved. We'll see who changed it, when they changed it, and then we'll see a line number. And then lastly, we'll see what exactly the content of that line was. So if it wasn't paging off the screen, you would actually see the entire contents of those lines. Um, but as we can see now, we have a line that is currently not committed that we could then add to our repository. So how do we take this change that we've just added to our terminal and then add it into our repository? Any guesses? Add it? Yeah, it's just the same way as adding a file to a repository, you add additional changes to the repository. So whenever you need to include additional changes to your repository, use git add. So we do a git add of test.markdown. We do our git diff. We'll notice that there are no changes. That's because we're comparing the staged copy, so in other words, the things that we're getting ready to commit to the current state of the files. And since the staged copy includes our changes, we don't see anything appearing here. If we did git, git diff dash dash staged, we'll instead see the changes since the last commit. That, are, that have been staged onto the repository so that we can commit them. So now that we're satisfied with those changes, we can make another commit. How many of you have noticed that the staging thing is really confusing? Wow, you guys get it, cool. You're smarter than I am. It took me like weeks to figure out how the stage works. It probably just means they haven't been poisoned by SVN yet. Maybe. Um, so there are some other repository systems, um, SVN and Mercurial. Um, both of those operate without this staging concept. Um, some of the benefits of the stage is you can add subsets of changes to files to the stage and then commit them separately, which is something you can't really do in Mercurial or in SVN very easily, if at all. Luckily, that's a little high level for what you guys are learning right now, so don't worry about it too much. Yeah. So if we look at our log again, we'll now see that there are two commits. We'll see the commit hash, or the commit ID, for the commits that we've made. And we'll see the log messages, an interesting beginning, and then an additional commit. So we know what we changed, we know who changed it, where it was changed. So something else we may want to know at this point is what's called the ref log. So if we wanted to see where we were working recently, the ref log keeps track of where we were working most recently. So at the top, it'll show the most recent place we were, and then it kind of goes back in time as we step down the list. Um, the first line is the commit hash of the, I, yes? Uh, what if you just want to look at recent commits? So if you want to look at just recent commits, use git log. If you want to look at where you were working recently, use git ref log. This whole where you were working thing, we'll kind of cover a little bit more once we talk about branches and Well, if, if you on. notice, it's sort of ordering the commits based on when they were done chronologically. Mm -hmm. So the oldest at the bottom. Yes. How do you get it to reverse to see the most recent commits at the bottom? So it's a flag for log, isn't it? Yeah. So, so you have like a thousand commits. Yeah. So by default, if you do it get log, it'll show the most recent one at the top. Okay. Um, but I believe there is a sorting 
thing that you can do. If it does, if there's not a sorting thing, you can use other Unix commands to reverse the order of the. Oscar, I think you're first to answer. Well, I, I think what you're asking is if you have say a thousand commits, it'll end up at the bottom, right? You won't be able to see the top one. Yeah. Well, what Git actually does is if it's too long, like bigger than your screen, it uh, uses what's called a pager. Okay. So it actually start at the top for you. It shows you the first page. You can hit page down and go to the next page or page. Uh, okay. You hit Q to exit. Yeah, that, that's what I was talking about. Yeah. Okay. So I've jumped into the hack pack just so we have something that has a bunch of commits already. And I'm going to execute git log. So what it's done is it's automatically paged it. And we see some of the most recent commits that have been made to the hack pack. We see Marshall's changes adding the word ladder um, and adding an Emacs config to the hack pack. But if we scroll down to the bottom, we'll see the initial version of the presentations for Clemson ACM. You can also limit it to say, I only want the most recent five or so to dis be displayed in the log. Yeah, so it's the very versatile. You can adjust whatever you like. And the way that you do that is something like that. So that will give us just the most recent three commits. That's four. Or four commits, excuse me. So head, capital H-E-A-D refers to our current location. Tilde three says, give me the last, the three things that came before that. So the parent of the parent of the parent of the current commit. So you have your address as users.noreply.github.com. Does that make it a repository on GitHub? So that came from a repository on GitHub and someone clicked the merge button, probably me. But um, Linus Torvalds has a very interesting and lengthy reason why you should primarily not use the web tools on GitHub, but a lot of companies and a lot of people do use them. So I suggest that if you're interested in to reasons why. So it doesn't really matter where it's going, you just worry about using Git on your terminal and that's that's it. You don't, it doesn't really matter where it goes. You don't need to see it. Yeah, that would that would be my recommendation. Okay. But others disagree with me, so. We'll explain things like GitHub a little while later. So, let's say that we made a mistake in a file. Let's say you're Austin. So, if we want to, so if we look at test.markdown, we see that Austin's mistake is in fact there. But let's say we wanted to get back to our original version without Austin's mistake. The way that we do this is kind, this is probably the first piece of black magic that you're going to see. So what we're going to do is get checkout hyphen hyphen test.markdown. So what this is telling Git to do is Tell Git to retrieve the version of a particular file, specifically test.markdown, and apply it to the working copy. Or perhaps uh, more directly for this one, dump all of the changes that have been made currently. So now if we cat the test.markdown file, we'll see that Austin's mistake is no longer present. Now here's an important distinction. <coughs> Normally when you're doing stuff with a git, if you ever commit something, you can get it back. If you don't commit it, you probably can't get it back. So because we checked this stuff out, my mistake never happened, which is nice for me, but bad if we ever want to get it back if it wasn't really a mistake. So if you ever might need it, be sure to commit it. First. And if you're worried about having a dirty commit history, there is, there are ways within git to kind of clean it up and hide your mistakes from your um, co-workers. You can do whatever you want with history, actually. You can make it look like you just fathomed this perfect code from nothing. It's great. But you probably shouldn't. No, you can't. Uh, but you probably shouldn't. <laughs> I'm the devil's advocate. I can say that. Okay. So there's some other commands that you should be aware about. Um, git reset is slightly different than git checkout. So one way that you might use git reset is to reset the state of all of the files in the current working or in the current repository. So the way that you would do that is with the command git reset head because refer of course to the last commit dash dash hard. So that means 
write the state of the last commit to the working copies. Basically the same thing, or very similar to the way that git checkout minus minus file name works, but this is operating on all of the changes and all of the files. Git reset is a very strange and versatile command, so if you're ever confused and want to learn more about how to roll back changes using reset, type in man git reset, and it gives a very comprehensive explanation that is a bit too long for this presentation. There is a manual page for every git command, and you should read them if you're ever confused. They're very helpful. Yes. Um, the other thing that we want to talk about at this point, we're not going to demonstrate it, is the concept of git revert. So when you do commits, you have a series of changes that follow in an order. So what revert does is it takes the history of commits and it undoes one of them, making a commit with those changes to undo that specific commit. So basically think of it as backing out a specific commit. It's like adding another note to your log that says, I undid that stuff I did a while ago. So if you have a situation where you want to undo something that someone else did, but you want to possibly be able to get back to un what you undid, get revert is the way to do that. Um, not something you have to do every day. Um, in fact, I can't think of a time that I've had to use it. Um, but it is a useful tool to have at your disposal and is generally preferred to doing a reset on a public project and doing it by git reset. Um. All right, we're going to talk about one of potentially the most confusing things in git. Now, you guys have proven that you're smart, so you might get this a lot faster than I did. We're going to be talking about a branch. <coughs> now, let's step back for a second. And Robert and I have been talking about how when we're working with Git, we have been sort of looking at these, we have these commits and we're looking at one of them. Maybe we step back in time to look at an older one or we want to do something different from an older one. Anyway, looking at that, um, that commit in the history is that head thing that Robert was talking about. Head is kind of a pointer to one of those commits so that you can move around really easily because it doesn't actually have any content to it. It's just letting us know where we're looking at. A branch is one of those things. A branch is just a word or a pointer to a specific commit somewhere in your Git working tree, which means because it's a pointer, you can have as many of them as you want with little cost. And using branches, you can move around in your history and create new histories that branch off like a big tree. That is, technically speaking, what a branch is. Generally, when people talk about a branch in a version of a project, they talk about kind of a set of related changes. For example, most big coding projects have this one master branch, which we'll talk about for Git in a little while, that you, that is the perfect branch that contains all the good code. But then they also have a branch of development buggy code or maybe a branch for maintaining something really old that needs to work on old stuff but has different content than the real branch does. Or a branch with all of Austin's style changes to the PowerPoints. Or a branch with all of Austin's terrible code changes, never mind. So branches are useful for the the abstract idea of a branch is useful for trying out something new or building out new features so that you don't corrupt your original work in case you just want to get rid of it all later. Once you're finished working on a branch, you can merge it into your current content, the master branch, or you can just get rid of it if you don't like it. Now, going back to what master is, like I mentioned before, there's the, this idea of one master branch, which is probably, I guess, the trunk of the tree if you're thinking about it with that sort of um, thought in mind. Master is idealized as the stable, final, shareable, one branch that is the most important. In big team projects, you don't want to make changes directly to master. In many companies, you're not allowed to do that, actually. You have to have a side branch for your changes before they get merged in. Um, 
Master is the default name for the branch that you are on by default with Git projects. So when you type Git in it, you start out with the master branch if you're in control. Um, probably will show you. We are on branch master right now. But if we wanted to make a new branch, which metaphorically speaking is this new pathway to look at different commits, it's also just that one pointer to a commit that we're working on. Why don't you explain what you're doing? So what I just did is I said git checkout dash b for create branch and then I gave it a branch name, in this case new changes. So in this version we'll put fun stuff in a file called foo. Okay, so we'll go ahead and add foo, and we'll go ahead and commit foo. Okay, so if we look at our git log at this point, we'll see that we have a file called foo, an additional commit, and an interesting beginning, so three commits. But what if we go back to the master branch? So we do git checkout. This is the primary way that you're going to be using checkout. And we say git checkout master. It'll say that we've switched to the branch master. And we see that the file foo is gone. <coughs> if we look at our log, we'll also see that our most recent commit is gone. Well, it didn't really disappear. Now, before we fix that, I want to add one more file to our sample project here. So I'm going to create a file and we're going to call it even more fun stuff and we're going to put that into bar. Okay. So at this point we'll add it and we'll commit it. We're on master right now, right? That's correct. So now if we look at our git log, we'll see that we have an added foo and we had an add where we had an added bar commit here. Robert, do you have any way to visualize the current working tree? Not easily. Not easily, okay. Um, a marker on our board is probably the best. Okay. How many of you can see this or cannot see this over here? Okay, let me know if, it, we can't, if you can't see anything. Now, Robert has been working with two branches. There's master and there's, what was the other one? Um, fun stuff? Yes, new changes actually. New changes, that's right. Now again, is there anyone who cannot see this? Okay, cool. So if we visualize that we have this very silly looking tree, looks more like a barbell right now, where each of these little dots indicates a commit. Now, this was our initial commit, which was uh, an interesting beginning, and here was an additional commit. Now before Robert started out with all this stuff <laughs> of adding branches, this one right here, that was where head was pointed. Head is just a pointer to a commit. When he checked out a new branch, oh, I forgot to mention, this is also where master was pointing, because master is also just a branch. Then he checked out a new branch, which was called new changes. So new changes also ended up pointing to this thing, just the second commit. So at this point, we have three pointers all pointing to the same commit. Right. Then he made this new commit called added bar. We'll put it here. When he was working on the new changes branch, and now head and new changes, because head is just where you are right now, is pointing to this new commit. And then when he checked out master again, he moved head back to pointing at the same thing master was pointing at. So even though this new changes, what, what new changes is pointing at? This commit where he added these bar. The no, foo fire. Foo. That exists, but we can't see it right now because master 
and the head don't know that it exists. It's just not part of what we're working on. So then when he created this other commit from master that was added bar, that's what head and master now point to. <coughs> so our tree has split. Master points to this, new changes points to this, and we can move flawlessly back and forth between them by moving the head pointer by just checking out the two different things. And from there, this tree could become more and more complex, or it could just be simple, or they could be joined together at some point just to create one single master branch. Does that make sense? So what I'm going to demonstrate at this point is what's called merging. So merging takes all of the changes that have happened since a set of branches diverged and attempts to recombine them in an intelligent manner. So when we do this, it'll ask us to create a commit message. We'll accept the default commit message. If you're using vim, it's colon wq. And it'll tell us that we've made a merge by a recursive strategy. And we've added a file called foo with one line. So if we look at the current state of our directory, we now have foo, bar, and test.markdown. Okay? And if we look at our git log, we'll see that we have merge branch of new changes, and we'll see that we have both of the commits, added foo and added bar, that we previously had on both branches. Now if we look at our current branch, we'll see that we're on the master branch. If we go back to new changes though, and do a git log, we'll notice that we only have the three commits. We do not have the commit from master where we added bar, and we do not have the merge commit where we combined the two branches together. Because we left the pointer that refers to new changes back at the position that it was prior to the merge. So the new changes pointer had not changed. Hence, we don't see any of those changes here. Any questions? Depending on the way you work, one more thing to mention about merging, you may use merging all the time or you may only use it sometimes because you might want to have a new branch for every single change you make, or you might not want to have any branches at all. It really depends on what you or your company are doing. Now, you may have heard someone ask a question earlier about GitHub. How many of you have heard of that before? All right, most of you, cool. GitHub and Bitbucket are two free hosts <coughs> for remote Git repositories. They're, they make it very easy for you to share code with teammates or collaborate on open source projects with people across the world. They, you can get free private repositories for working on your own personal projects if you have a .edu email address. Um, there's a, I think you have to go through the student pack now to get that? Possibly. Yeah, okay. So we'll send out an email about how to get through that if you're interested. There's also this new thing that some of the smart people here in the School of Computing added in the last year or so, is buffet.cs.clemson.edu. If you're a student here, which I imagine most of you are, you can create your own Git repos to work on local projects or projects with teammates or whatever from Buffet, and you can make as many as you want. It's really handy if you just want to have a server where you can push your repositories, push your code, to either collaborate or work with, your, work with yourself on different computers or just to back up your stuff. If you push a Git repo somewhere, that's essentially a, a nice tag to back up of what you've been working on. So it's this easy to make a new repo on, um, buffet. on buffet. We don't really need to go through it right now, but it's pretty easy and take a look if you're interested in having a remote repository. Also, if you happen to run your own server, it is fairly easy to create your own Git remote repository where you can push and pull code from, just to have another backup. I actually do that to host this presentation on my own VPS. It's a virtual private server, by the way. 
Now, when you're working with remote Git repositories, there's a concept in Git of an object called a remote. Um, by default, the one, the default one is called origin. If you clone a repository from somewhere, for example, with our ACM hackpack repo, it already has a remote set up pointing to GitHub so that we can pull and push from to and from GitHub. Pulling and pushing involve bringing down changes made to a remote repository, and pulling is, uh, sorry, pushing is taking your changes and shoving them into the upstream, and pulling is bringing down the changes that have been made by someone else. Yes, Foster. Okay. Hmm? Robert, what are you setting up over here? I was setting up the remote repository to demonstrate how you could push to Buffet, okay. but I haven't set up public key access, okay. so we, we we'll won't do that later. That now. Um, Luckily, most of these remote repositories have tutorials that are not very long and pretty simple about how to get going with these sorts of things. And Working with them is as simple as using git push and git pull, mostly. Mm -hmm. Working with remote repositories is sometimes complex, but you guys won't have to worry about that too much for right now. All right, Robert, tell them what they should do. So the short answer is don't cheat. Um, that was last week. Yes, but don't cheat here either. Don't make any of your repositories that you're working on for personal class projects public repositories. Make sure they are private. That way, you won't have any potential academic integrity conflicts that you may run into. Um, other things that you should never commit to a public Git repository, or probably even a private one for that matter, API keys, passwords, your private SSH key. Um, these are things that you should not as a rule of thumb, ever include in a Git repository. Now we mentioned that if you commit something, usually it's pretty easy to get it back. That can work against you when you accidentally commit something that you shouldn't have and you want to get rid of it because it's actually kind of difficult. So if you accidentally commit an API key or a password, <coughs> then you're going to have to do some weird finagling to make sure that Git totally forgets it existed. Yes, Foster, correct me. Even if Git forgets it existed, there are actually people who just dedicate their computers to scraping GitHub for API keys, so it's out there if you push it. Oh, or yeah. Immediately. If Change you, it. Yeah. Don't try to remove it from the history. Just, just That's, Foster raises a good point. If you're ever in the situation where you have one of these critical part, bits of text and it gets into the hands of someone else, then it's probably a really, really good idea to go and change that password or API key or invalidate your credit card number, that sort of thing. Be safe, be paranoid. So one other thing that we probably should talk about is the concept of what's called a dot git ignore file. So let's go ahead and create one. Okay, so in our .git ignore file, we're going to say that we want to ignore all files with a txt extension. Okay, so now we're going to edit a new file that we're going to call test.txt. Okay, and we'll put some stuff in that file. Yep. So once we've written those changes, we see that both files have been created. We do an ls-l. Is anyone stuck in Vim right now? OK, good. OK. So also, I want to point out one thing. You'll see that there's a .git directory. That's where Git is actually storing all of the changes in the repository that we've been talking about. If you ever at any point delete the .git directory in the root of the project, any changes that you've saved locally to that machine aside from your current working copy are gone. Um, and you'll have to reclone it and do some finagling to get it back in place. So don't ever delete the .git directory unless you really know what you're doing. Now, if we do a git status, you'll see that the only file it lists as being new is the .git ignore file. Notice it doesn't list test.txt. And that's because we included it in our .git ignore file. Now, that's kind of at a project level or a directory level. 
but there's also what's called a core.excludes variable that you can set in your git configuration. This points to a file that you can use where you can specify kind of a global git ignore for your project. So you don't necessarily have to make the same tweaks to every project um, to ignore, say, .o files if you're working in a C project or something of that form. So any questions about when you would want to use a .git ignore file or .core excludes? You'll mostly run into one run into wanting to use one of these things. When you have some files that you don't care about but Git thinks you do, and every time you check the status, it says, hey, you didn't track these dozen files, and it bothers you every time. So that's what an, that's what an ignore file is for. The other thing that you might use a .git ignore file for would be things like binaries that get generated when you compile. Like a.out. Um, or Java, anything that's basically a binary format you generally don't want to track that in Vim, especially if it's going to, or Git, especially if it's going to be changing. Because whenever it changes, you'll have massive diffs of your binaries that have changed. So Does anyone not know what we're talking about when you say binary? Okay. Well, you guys are smart. So, at some point, you will eventually, inevitably, fall into the horrible land which is called a merge conflict. So we'll make this kind of brief, but basically a merge conflict is where you make changes to two different branches and then try to merge those changes, but the result of merging those changes, Git doesn't have an intuitive way to do it. Um, so I'm going to very quickly demonstrate how to do that. So first I'm going to add the Git ignore. Now I'm going to create a new, I'm going to edit the um, test.markdown file and I'm going to add bar to the end of this line. Now I'm going to check out the new changes branch that we had earlier. I've added an alias to my terminal to allow me to check out a different branch so you're going to have to type out the full word checkout in order to do this. Um, if we edit the test.markdown we'll notice that line is not Excuse me, I'll check out master. Oh, okay, it's been showing it's modified. So if we edit this, and then instead of bar, we say foo, Git's not going to know what to do with this change. What you would have seen if I had remembered to add the file before committing it, what you saw was an empty commit earlier. Um, what you would have seen is you would see it say, merge conflict, merge failed, please fix the conflict. You can do this in a couple different ways. One is with git merge tool, which will open up your favorite graphical tool in order to resolve the merge conflict. One that I would highly recommend is called meld. Um, but you can also use vimdiff or any other diff management tool. Emacs has a tool called eMerge that you can use, not to be confused with the package manager. But um, they're fairly painless to use. And very importantly, don't forget to retest after merges. Usually, if you run into something that Git is telling you needs to be done, it will sort of walk you through what you have to do. It won't be just totally broken no location of where you're supposed to go from here. <clears throat> okay, so what if, you've, what if you've watched us go through all this and you're not as confused as I am and you think this stuff is easy, it's, it has to be more powerful than that. I want to be able to automatically do stuff whenever I commit something and I want to be able to do all sorts of stuff without even needing to do it myself or I want to have a wiki that goes along with my Git repository. If you are power hungry, like I am, 
then there's a bunch of different ways that you can get more power to go along with your Git repositories. Some hosts, or most hosts, like Bitbucket and GitHub, will provide wikis or documentation about what's going on with your code. You can track issues. If you're working on a big open source project and someone says, this doesn't work for me, then GitHub has a way to track that instance of someone's code not working. There is a thing called pull requests. GitHub sort of originated them. They're for reviewing a change that someone wants to make to your repository, which what? Pull requests are actually part of native Git. They are? They're, yes. All right, Robert will correct me. So pull requests are part of Git proper. And basically, on the Linux kernel, when they go to actually prepare changes and send changes to one another, if they have separate repositories and you don't necessarily have a direct line, what they would do is email a patch, a specially formatted patch, to the Linux kernel development mailing list. The command that would do this was a pull, or the thing that you're doing here is what's called a pull request. You're requesting for changes to be pulled from your repository to, and usually, the mainline branch of the Linux kernel. So it would be sent over email, this special patch format, and then there's a receive patch script that would run whenever your email received one of these patches, and then it would create a branch accordingly. So. As usual, lots to make mistakes from the system. Now there are also these things called Git hooks. We'll only touch on them briefly. Basically, they enable you to do something automatically, run a script, for example, when something happens in the Git repo. If you push a change to a server and you want it to do something automatically, that can happen with the Git hook. They're really cool. You can also create your own commands, basically, by aliasing together things. That's part of Git configuration. Um, we'll kind of skip over that. There's a very powerful plugin for Vim, if you're a Vim user, called Fugitive, that lets you work with Git from inside of the text editor. And there is, of course, Git help, and we didn't mention it here, but the manual pages for finding out how stuff actually works. Both Git help and the man pages contain the same information, so you can get to them either way. Now, what if you have, if you like user interfaces and you hate the terminal, and this was just a waste of time because you don't like text? Well, Robert? So. There are tools that let you interact with version control systems, such as Git, using a graphical user interface. Some of them are quite good. Um, GitHub has a desktop client that you can use for Windows and Mac, I believe, yep. as does Bitbucket, which will allow you to make some of these kinds of changes on your computer um, through a more graphical tool. Um, how many of you use slash like using Eclipse? So the newest version of Eclipse has a Git plugin that allows you to do these kinds of changes through Eclipse and view graphical diffs and graphically handle commits, but uh, you won't have the same level of power as you have from the terminal. Uh, that Git plugin also, if you clone a repository and you set up a new Java project in it, will automatically give you a dot get ignored for all of your binary files mm -hmm. so that we don't have to worry about. It. Yeah. It also writes a bunch of other stuff to your git ignore. So people that are git purists will be annoyed by what um, Eclipse offers to do for you when it really shouldn't. <coughs> but it is a very valuable tool if you don't like working in the terminal as your primary workhorse. All right, we're in the home stretch, almost there. You can go to become code experts with Git. Now, as a summary, please use version control. It's really cool. It's good for you and anyone who ever interacts with your code, and companies love it. If you have Git expert on your resume, that's one more thing that they're gonna say, wow, we should take this person and hire them immediately. Git is only one of many distributed version control systems. Another is Mercurial, which is a little bit simpler to use. Some of the professors around here prefer it. And um, there's also other more legacy-oriented version control systems like CVS and SVN. We like it better. 
And that's pretty much it for the summary. For further resources, we have these links. If you take a look at this presentation online, we'll send a link out to it if you wrote your name and username down. There is a great book called ProGit. There is a cheat sheet we're linking to, some information about Git workflows because figuring out what to do with all this power is kind of tough. We have a link to Mercurial and a link to why commits messages, plural, yes. are important. Now, that's everything, yes. Is anyone catastrophically lost or do you have any questions? If you're catastrophically lost, it might be a better idea to come and complain to us later. But for now, any questions? All right. Did anyone not learn anything and thinks this was a waste of time? Don't be shy. I did. All right. In that case, that wraps up our presentation on Git.